Hallelujah. It's always a privilege to stand behind this sacred desk to bring forth the word of God. How many of you recognize that it's a privilege and it's an honor to serve the Lord? It's a privilege and it is an honor to serve the Lord. And even though serving the Lord comes with a price, it's worth it in the end. For our Lord pays high dividends. And even if he didn't, the joy and the satisfaction that we feel on the inside for just knowing him and serving him is all that we ever need. It's enough to keep us going. Amen? Well, this morning, we want to get straight into the Word of God, and so we want to just turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 10. Ecclesiastes is a very small book that follows the book of Proverbs. So you can start from Psalms, then Proverbs, then Ecclesiastes. I want to thank God for the in-house ministers this morning. Amen. That in spite of pastor not being here, the work of God continues. Amen? Amen. And we need to continue, continue to appreciate Brother Tommy, Brother Glenroy, Brother Errol, Brother Cleveland. We know that this church will never be in want or lacking in any which way. So are we there in Ecclesiastes? Amen. Okay, we're going to be just reading one verse. And that is verse 1. It says, Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor or a stinking smell. So doth a little folly that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. I'll read that again. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. I find the word of God is so <laughs> beautiful, rich, and deep. Solomon, who was the wisest man that ever lived, apart from Jesus, of course, wrote under the influence of the Holy Spirit this verse, making a comparison between the effect of dead flies in the anointing oil and a little folly in the life of one that is held in reputation for wisdom and honor. He makes a comparison. And he makes the point that as dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary, which is a very sweet and appealing smelling oil, even as dead flies cause that anointing oil to stink, so too does a little folly in the life of one who is held in high regard for wisdom and honor. When we reflect on this verse, brothers and sisters, and we consider people like Tiger Woods, a successful sports icon in the field of golf, a multi-millionaire, a person who was in reputation, a good reputation for a while, who had everything that he needed, everything that he could have desired. When we think of people like Arnold Schwarzenegger, an actor, producer, 
businessman, author, activist, politician who served two terms as the governor of California. When we think of Richard Nixon, who was an American politician who served as the 37th president of the United States and was the only president to resign from office. And when we consider our own former chief magistrate and short-lived high court judge, Marcia A. Cesar, or whatever her name is, we can only conclude that this verse is true, that a little folly can cause the reputation of one that is held in high honor and wisdom to stink. We can only conclude that this verse is true and it applies to both sinner and saint alike. Ministers of the gospel, namely Jimmy Swaggart, Eddie Long, and as quite recently as Israel Houghton, just to name a few in the kingdom, can also testify to the veracity of this verse, as they too have experienced firsthand the effect and the consequence of their own folly. What is folly? Folly is synonymous with the word fool or foolish. And it speaks of foolish actions. It speaks of a lack of good sense. It is acting in an indifferent manner towards wise instruction. It is acting in an indifferent manner concerning wise instruction. And it involves any way of thinking or any way of behaving that is careless and thoughtless. Our text tells us that it only takes a little folly, a little, to bring a person of reputation into disrepute, into shame, dishonor, scandal, and disgrace. And I'm here to declare to all of us here this morning that little things matter. Little things matter. Too often as Christians, we make judgments and we make statements based on what we think is important and what we think is unimportant when it comes to the word of God. We are all guilty of it sometimes. We make our own judgments and we make foolish statements concerning what we think is important in the word of God and what we think is not so important. Well, there is nothing in the Bible, no instruction, no command, and no counsel of God that is trivial, that is insignificant, and that is unimportant. There is nothing in the Bible, nothing that is written in this book that is considered or that is unimportant. Regardless of what is written, everything that is written is important, regardless of how simple the instruction may seem. There are some in the body of Christ and in other religi religious circles who believe that there are varying degrees of sin, that there are big sins and there are little sins. And as a result, they choose what they want to believe or what they want to obey. They choose what they want to obey. They choose what they deem is important and what they want to ignore. But I want us all to understand something this morning. 
We are all being warned and we are all being admonished this morning concerning the dangers of folly, which is foolish thinking and foolish actions. And so to disregard any part of God's word or any instruction or counsel of the Lord is folly and it has consequences. To disregard even the simplest instruction of God that is outlined in the word of God is folly and it has serious consequences. Last Sunday, we heard a message from our brother Glenroy, and it was entitled, The Power of a Witness. And we learned, we learned, apart from all the other things that he mentioned and that we were admonished, we learned that the entire universe testifies, and the entire universe is a witness of the existence of God and his power. We were also reminded of God's purpose in raising up a people unto himself. And that purpose is that we, together with all of creation, would testify and bear witness that Jesus Christ is alive. And that through our lives, through our lives and the presence of his spirit that resides in us, Christ would be revealed to a lost and a dying world. We are called to be witnesses of the Lord. And our lives are designed with purpose to reflect him, to testify of him. The Lord wants to reveal himself through us, through each and every one of us. That is his purpose. That is his will. And that is his desire. He wants to be glorified and magnified through our lives. Each and every one of us, born of his Holy Spirit, we are called to be the light of the world, and we are called to be the salt of the earth. Not some of us. All of us are called. But I want us to listen to something very carefully this morning. Even though that is God's intent, his will, his desire. If our testimony or if our witness is marred, if our witness is blemished, if it is flawed, if it is tarnished because of this thing called folly, then our lives would not be an effective witness. And as a result, God's purpose would not be accomplished through us. Just as the anointment, just as the ointment, sorry, of the apothecary was spoiled by contamination. Hear me, brothers and sisters. Just as the anointing oil or the ointment of the apothe apothecary was spoiled by contamination and it stank because of dead flies, so too our witness, our reputation, and our testimony can stink. So too our reputation, our witness, and our testimony can stink because of foolish actions, because of a lack of good sense, and because of an indifferent attitude towards the word of God. The word of God is not to be taken lightly. Maintaining a good reputation is important in being an effective witness. Maintaining a good reputation is important in being an effective witness. And I'm not speaking about a rep, having a reputation as a businessman or as a teacher or as a pro, any other professional in, in some kind of specialized field. I'm speaking about our reputation as a Christian. I am speaking about our reputation as a Christian or as a child of God. 
that is the reputation that we have to guard and maintain and protect above all things. Nowadays, there are many people who call themselves Christians. Many. And they call themselves Christians because maybe they attended church once or twice. They came to the altar and that was it. But when we examine their lifestyle and we hear their conversation and we see their dress and their behavior and their attitude, we have to wonder what kind of Christian they really are. A person simply professing that they are Christian does not make them a Christian. A simple profession doesn't make us a Christian. Yes, a Christian is one who believes that Jesus Christ is both Lord and God and has embraced him and him alone as the only savior of the world. But it does not stop there. It does not stop there. A Christian is also one who orders or conducts his or her lifestyle according to the word of God. It is one who conducts his or her lifestyle according to the word of God. Not according to the world or what they think or what they believe. And when a person lives their life according to God's word, there will be the fruit. There will be fruit or the evidence that they are true Christians. When a person is living their life according to the word of God, there will be fruit. There will be the evidence that they are true Christians because they would reflect Christ. We are supposed to reflect Christ. Jesus said, by their fruit, you will know them. It's not what we say about ourselves. It is by, by our fruit that we will be known, both by God and by the people around us. That is what it means by being an effective witness. I don't know about you, but sometimes we, can, we come into contact with a person and after dealing with them, we have this sense that they know the Lord. Why? There is something that is manifested through their lives. There is fruit. There is the evidence of a sweet spirit of a right attitude, of a caring heart. And so preserving a good name, brothers and sisters, is important. Preserving a good name, our good name, is important. But what is even more important is preserving our testimony. And we do that by adhering to the principles of God's word and conducting our lives as wise children, as wise children, and not as fools. We have no control over what people think of us and what they say about us. We have no control. But we do have control and we have the responsibility concerning who we are, concerning how we live our lives, and what we stand for. This is what we have control over. And so this morning, we want to look at some things that are often overlooked and ignored. We want to look at the things that are often overlooked and ignored, that have the propensity of affecting our testimony and our witness. In the book of Songs of Solomon, chapter 2, and verse 15, it says, and it should be on the board, it's the little foxes that spoil the vines. 
It's the little foxes that spoil the vines. The analogy of a fox is used here in this scripture because of the nature of the animal. Have you ever heard the saying, as cunning as a fox? Or as sly as a fox? Well, there's a reason for that saying. For those of you who may know or may not know, a fox's den is normally a burrow or a hole under the ground. In other words, they live and they hide out beneath the surface or under the surface so as to be inconspicuous. The fact that they are hidden or concealed it doesn't mean that they're not there. Remember, it's the little foxes that destroy vineyards. The fact that they are hidden beneath the surface doesn't mean that they are not there. What happens is that gradually, over a period of time, they destroy large vines, large vines, and they destroy large and huge vineyards of grapes, small foxes, little foxes eating away at the fruit of the vineyard. In like manner, brothers and sisters, it's the little foxes in our lives that are hiding, that are hiding under the radar, so to speak, that are eating away at our relationship with God. It's the little things, the habits, the sins, the practices. It's the little things that are eating away at our relationship with God, little by little, piece by piece, degree by degree. It's called sin, pet sins, that we are committing and practicing without anyone's knowledge. Secret things, things that we know to be wrong, Things that we know bring displeasure to the heart of God. Things that we know, if it comes out in the open, will be scandalous, will bring shame and disgrace to our personality and to those affected by us. We think that is without anyone's knowledge, but yet, we practice them, things that God forbids and tells us to avoid. Yet we are entertaining these things quietly and secretly, just like the little foxes that abide under the surface of the vineyard. And we may not realize it, but it's doing damage to our character, to our testimony, to our witness, to our relationship with God. It's eating away at that relationship. And what we fail to realize is that there is danger and there is a consequence to what we consider as a little disobedience because it's not found out because we're getting away with things Small things matter, brothers and sisters, and small things also grow. They grow into big things. Think of ourselves, we were born into this world, we didn't grow big. We didn't come out of our mother's womb big. We came out as an inf small. Small things grow. I've never heard of a person becoming a drunkard or a thief or a swearer, or a liar, or an adulterer, or a criminal all at once. I've never heard of somebody who just went to bed holy and righteous and got up the following morning as a drunk, or as a drunkard, or as a thief, or as an adulterer. It happens gradually, little by little, beginning with thoughts and behavior that is not addressed. 
the little things, brothers and sisters. Gradually, little by little, beginning with thoughts and actions that are not addressed by us. I'm sure that none of us here wants a little cancer. Anybody wants a little cancer? Cancer, you know cancer, the disease? Does anyone here want a little cancer? No. Why? Because cancer has the capacity to destroy a person's body. It has the capacity to destroy a person's life if it is not treated. And if it is not treated, it will grow. If that small cancer that is detected anywhere in our body, if it is not treated, it will grow and it will infect other parts of our body. I have never heard of a person having cancer who didn't attend to it and that cancer just drying up and dying because we ignored it. Because we didn't attend to it. I've never heard of a cancer just drying up and dying when it is ignored and unattended to, apart from God's intervention, of course. And God can do all things. Where medical science fails or is limited, God is able. But apart from God's intervention, if cancer is not treated, if it is ignored, if we pretend it's not there, if it is unattended, what will happen is that it will grow and it will infect other parts of our, our body. So too are sinful habits. So too are practices that are contrary to the word of God. So too are those pet sins that we are indulging in that nobody knows about. And if they are not addressed, brothers and sisters, they will act as a cancer to our spiritual lives. They will act as a cancer to our spiritual lives. And it will spread and contaminate every area of our being until it destroys us. Sin destroys our relationship with God. Sin separates us. From God it did in the Garden of Eden and it continues to separate man from God today never underestimate the power of sin and what is what it is capable of never underestimate it a termite brothers and sisters is a very small insect but it can destroy a three-story building or a three-story house if it is ignored a little termite left alone will eat out your whole house and it's only when it collapses you realize it's termites that was working under the surface in the background eating, eating away all our investments a flea you know like ticks and fleas a flea a very small creature it's a very small creature, but a lot of them, enough of them, can kill the largest dogs. And so, brothers and sisters, the little fox, fox number one, that we have to guard and look out for, that will hinder our testimony, hinder our witness, bring our reputation as a child of God to nothing. Fox number one pet sins fox number two little fox number two the tongue the tongue James 3 5 and 6 tells us even so the tongue is a little member see small is a little member and boasteth great things. 
Behold how great a matter as little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, body parts that is. That it defiles or it has the capacity to defile the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on the fire of hell. Our tongues, brothers and sisters, if they are unrestrained and unmanaged will cause our reputation to also stink. If our tongues are unrestrained and unmanaged, it can also affect our reputation just as the dead flies in the ointment. There is nothing uglier and more distasteful and more displeasing to God than hearing a Christian defame, bad mouth, slander, and gossip about another person. Especially if the other person is another member of the body of Christ. Nothing is more, nothing is uglier and more displeasing to God. We may think that it's just a little slander. <laughs> it's not fornication and adultery. It's just a little bad mouth. After all, it's true. What I'm saying is true. And we may think that it's not affecting our Christian walk. And it's not affecting our testimony. But just think of our unsaved workers. Just think of our unsaved family members hearing our discussions. Be unkind with our words and judgmental and condemning. What kind of testimony is that? Is that the way the Lord deals with us? Is that Christ being revealed through our lives? We may think it's not affecting our Christian walk, but listen to Proverbs 6, 9, 6 16 to 19. These six things that the, does the Lord hate, not me, not Brother Glenn Roy, these six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. I don't think they have Christians that go around the, um, killing people. But we can defame someone's character and it's as though we kill them. A heart that devises wicked imaginations. Feet that are swift in running to mischief. We can't hold our mouths, you know. Quick, swift to mischief. And we don't consider gossip as mischief. But it's mischief. Carrying news is mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies. Do we know everything about every situation and about every person? Remember, there are always two sides to this story, and sometimes there are three. <laughs> it's the person's version, your version, and the truth. And sometimes when we bring a false report, we don't have to be in a court of law to be a false witness, testifying in a... In a untruthful way about another person's character or situation that involves them is a false witness that speaketh lies. And lastly, the last thing that is noted here that the Lord hates is he that soweth discord among brethren. Brothers and sisters, God is not the author of confusion. And if he's not the author of confusion, that means the devil is. The devil is the author of confusion. He is the one that is the accuser 
of the brethren. So whose side are we on? Little things that we consider little. It's not little, you know. But we consider it as little. That don't matter with God. It's not doing anything to me spiritually. So we think. So the question is, whose side are we on? Are we on the Lord's side? Or are we on the devil's side? You see, it's very easy to say we are on the Lord's side. But what is the fruit of our actions? What is the fruit of our tongues? What is the fruit in our homes? In our marriage? On our jobs? What is the fruit that we are producing? You see, brothers and sisters, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is what we call practical Christianity. Are we known as a confusion maker? Or are we known as a peacemaker? Some of us are saved here for many, many years. Many of us here have been long-standing members, not just of Holiness Revival, but in the body of Christ. But we're still having problems applying the basics to our lives. You know, we, we're always intrigued with, big, with new revelation and deep things. But what about the basics? What about the basic things? Are we applying those basics to our lives? And we wonder why our homes are in shambles and our relationships don't last. I'll tell you why. It's because of those little foxes in our lives. The areas of disobedience and stubbornness and unyieldedness and wanting our own way. That's eroding our relationship with our loved ones, with our co-workers, with members in the body of Christ. But more importantly, it's eroding our relationship with God. We're still on the question of the tongue. What about slack talk? Slack talk. Talk that have no, that doesn't have any restraint. It's slack, like old elastic. <laughs> what about that? We consider that small, right? What about rude jokes? Conversations that have sexual undertones. What about these things? Do we permit them in our lives? Do we indulge in them? Do we sit and listen to conversations that are vile, that are unclean, that are perverse? Do we? We may say, well, and not coming out of my mouth, so nothing wrong with it. The Bible says, be not a partaker of other men's sins. If you sit and indulge by listening, we are partaker with them. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers, to people around us, to the saved as well as the unsaved. What is our conversation like? It's the little foxes. It's the little folly, foolish actions that will bring a person's reputation, our reputation as a Christian into disrepute. Colossians 4, 6 says to us, the Lord says to us, 
we may just read over it and figure, well, it's not sexual sin. It's not murder. So it doesn't really count. It's a small thing, man. God, don't study that. Colossians 4, 6, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. In other words, we must be calculated in how we speak. It must be kind. We must consider the consequence of our words. Not all the time, because sometimes the words fly out and we regret it after. But we thank God for his mercy, amen? But it's not something that we purpose in our heart to indulge in. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Corrupt speech, brothers and sisters, always leads to corrupt behavior. Remember we talk about small thing grows. Small things grow. And corrupt things lead Corrupt speech leads to corrupt behavior, which in turn leads to a perverse lifestyle. Nothing just stays with where it begins. Sin has a way of like a cancer spreading and taking over every part of our being. We may feel that nothing is wrong with a little slack talk and a little rude joke. Well, the fact is that it doesn't matter what we feel and how we think. It is what is right in the sight of God. It is what God says. It is what he commands of us that is important. I am yet to understand. I don't know, maybe you can help me understand. But I'm yet to understand, brothers and sisters, how a born-again, spirit-filled believer can sit in the company of unredeemed people, can sit among unsaved people, and listen to curse word after curse word after curse word and feel comfortable. Help me understand this morning. I cannot understand. Maybe you could explain to me how a born-again, spirit-filled believer can sit in the company of an unsaved person who doesn't know better. That's the language of the world these days. If before long ago, people used to curse because they're angry. Because they get so in a rage, the, f the foul language comes out. But nowadays, it's part of everyday speech. It's, ag it's an adjective, like if it's normal. It is so disgusting to the air. So disturbing to the spirit. And yet, there are some in the body of Christ today. today. I hope there are none in Holiness Revival Ministries who feel comfortable sitting among the unredeemed who uses profanity in that regard. I am yet to understand how a born-again, spirit-filled believer can sit in front of a television or in a movie house or on your computer and hear profanity throughout the whole show or the whole movie and feel comfortable. What? If anybody comes into the room, huh? especially unsaved people, relatives or some pass by, we go into church on Sunday morning, huh? we're inviting them to church. And they're hearing and seeing and they're privy to what we're listening to and the kind of movies we're going to see. What kind of witness is that? Is God's purpose being accomplished through our lives? Or is our reputation... Or has our reputation already began to stink? We may not know what people are thinking of us or what they are saying about us, but they are seeing our lives are supposed to be epistles, the word of God revealed through us, through our lives. We are supposed to reveal what Christ is about. It's hypocritical, brothers and sisters. It's hypocritical. It's a hypocritical to feel as well that once we're not doing it, we're not saying the language that we are not defiled. That's a lie. And it goes against everything that is written in the Bible. God is holy. I'll say that again. God 
is holy. And there is nothing that is corrupt or perverse or obscene in him. There is nothing that is corrupt or perverse or obscene in God. How could we as his children feel comfortable indulging in these things? It means that something is wrong with our relationship with the Lord. We may not want to admit it. We might take offense if somebody tells us that. But Jesus says, by our fruit, by the evidence of our lives, we will know. There is a saying, garbage in, garbage out. And what we ingest and what we entertain and what we partake of will eventually be a part of our lives and it will flow through our life. Fox number three, a little look. A little look. Jesus said in Matthew chapter five and verse 28, he said, you have heard that it was said by them of all time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. One of the most despicable things to see, to see, is a professing Christian, man or woman, because nowadays women are real bold <laughs> and forward. They're not like long time. One of the most despicable things to see is a professing Christian, man or woman, worse yet, a minister of the gospel, trail a person of the opposite sex with their eyes, Scanning every part of the anatomy as they walk by. And all we are seeing, people who are looking on, is lust, lust, and more lust. And we think it's just a little look, a little look. A dress still can't pass, and we so. We might be in the, in the presence of our spouse, and we find it hard to keep our eyes straight. And what is even more despicable is if the person who is doing the scanning is married. What is even more despicable is an insult to your spouse. What kind of testimony is that, brothers and sisters? And what kind of image are we portraying to those who are looking on? We may think it's just a look. It's just a look. Nothing wrong with that. But it's a corrupt look. It's a corrupt look. And a corrupt look will always lead to corrupt actions. We can fool ourselves and we can tell ourselves that we're not doing anything wrong. And once we are not doing the act, we are okay. Remember, things start somewhere. There's always a beginning to something, you know. We don't become an adulterer and unfaithful and a womanizer overnight. Jesus said, and I'm, pro pro I'm pro paraphrasing, he says, the look is as good as the act. He said, if you just look at a woman, you come in, a, in a lustful way, you already commit the act in our hearts. Why? Because he knows all things. He knows the difference between a pure look, a casual look, and a corrupt look. So we could try to justify ourselves, but God knows. And Jesus says the look is as good as the act. And if we are indulging in this kind of behavior, that we are guilty of adultery. Indulging in pornography, brothers and sisters, 
in, and also finding pleasure in watching sexual acts on television, at the movies, or on our computer. It's perverse. It's perverse. You know, nakedness is an ugly thing. When Adam and Eve realized they were naked after they sinned, God didn't leave them exposed to run around like primitive people. He covered them. He, tell them. he made clothes for them and sewed it on. And so finding pleasure in watching these things is perverse, it's unclean, and it's treading on dangerous ground. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 29, he says, if your eye, your right eye offend you, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee. It is profitable for thee and for me that one of thy members should perish and not, thy, not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. In other words, he is saying that if our eye is causing us to sin, that we should do whatever is necessary to correct the problem, even if it means plucking out of our eye. Of course, he didn't mean that in a literal way, because you'll have plenty one, light, one eye, <laughs> people walking around in the kingdom of God. What he was saying was, take whatever drastic measures is necessary. Take whatever drastic measures or measures, yeah, measures is necessary in order to deliver our souls from hell. It is our responsibility, brothers, to manage our flesh and our desires and to bring our body and all parts of it into subjection to what God says. There is a saying that goes like this. Fools rush in where eagles fear to tread. <laughs> and the meaning is this. Foolish people do things that they know to be dangerous and harmful and displeasing to God, whilst wise people stay far away from them. A word, brothers and sisters, to the wise the wise at Holiness Revival Ministries, a word to the wise is sufficient. And lastly, fox number four, a little slothfulness. And this is a nice text. Proverbs 24, it's on the board. Proverbs 24, verses 30 to 34. It says here, Solomon writing, he says, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles, and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. All of this happened in the field of the slothful. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. One of the most subtle enemies of a child of God is a slumbering, complacent, and a lukewarm spirit. One of the most subtle enemies of any child of God. And we see in this passage of scripture, we see that laziness and slothful, slothfulness equals no results. We see from this text that laziness and slothfulness equals no results. I want us to understand this morning and recognize that our God, our Lord, our sweet Savior is result-oriented. Our Lord is result-oriented. 
And he wants to see results in what he has invested in. And I'm sure all the business people present here this morning could identify. We want to see results. We don't want to invest in a project in vain. So too, God, so too is God. God's investment, however, is not in dollars and cents. It's not in building of buying of properties and investing in the stock market. His investment is in man. His investment is in you and me and in every child of God. And God wants to see fruit in our lives. He wants to see results. He wants to see his work here. He wants to see his work advance in the earth. He wants to see souls saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. And so our role, brothers and sisters, in the kingdom of God is vital. Our role is vital to God fulfilling his purpose through our lives. And that is why upon his ascension into heaven, he commissioned his disciples to continue his work here on earth. He commissioned his disciples then, and his commission still stands today. And he said to all of us, and he's saying to all of us, he says, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel, teaching all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. We all have a commission of the Lord to advance his kingdom's work here on earth. To work while it is day. To be active in his kingdom. And it is our responsibility, brothers and sisters, to be profitable servants. Not slothful, not lazy, not complacent servants, but profitable in the kingdom of God. God hates laziness. He hates lukewarmness. He hates complacency. And the reason is, is because it produces no fruit. It, ha it produces no results. As the scripture says, a little slumber, a little sleep, a little folding of the hands. All comes to nothing. It produces nothing. And our God is result oriented. And that is why we are commissioned in the word of God to always be steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, putting our hands to the plow and doing what God has commissioned us to do. And so in closing, brothers and sisters, we need to watch out for the little things in our lives, the things, the little foxes that have creeped in to our lives, that are working in our lives to undermine our testimony, our relationship with God, and our reputation as children of God. Little things, as we heard in this message, can destroy our home. It can destroy our marriage. It can hinder our prayer life. Little things can stunt our spiritual growth and they can affect our relationship with God. We need to address the things in our lives that we know are a hindrance to us. The little foxes that are operating to spoil the fruit of our relationship with God. Amen? Let's all stand.
precious, wonderful Lord. We stand in your presence today. Recognizing that your eyes see all things, Lord. That all things are naked and open before you. So precious Father and God, we pray that you will continue your purifying work in our lives. We know that you are merciful. We know that you are a forgiving God. That you're slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. But we don't want to take your mercy for granted and your grace and your love. We want, Lord, to live our lives in the center of your will. Our desire today is that our lives will bring glory and honor and praise to your name. That we will be obedient children, reflecting you, Lord, wherever we are. That we will be a positive influence in our homes, on our jobs, and wherever, Lord, you carry us. So we pray that you will do a deeper work, Lord, that you will cleanse us, continue to cleanse us from within and make us holy as we have just sung. That you will continue, Lord, to make us uncomfortable concerning the things that are displeasing in your sight. That you will disturb our spirits, that you will make us restless. That you will deal with us as a loving and a good father will do, Lord. That you will bring correction and chastening where necessary. That we be conformed into your image and into your likeness. So we thank you for your word today, Lord, that you would choose not to leave us in ignorance concerning the dangers of these little things, these little foxes that are working in our lives to erode our testimony and our witness of you. So we desire to be a tool in your hands this morning and throughout our lifetime. We say, Lord, here we are. Here we are, Lord, use us. Here we are in your presence. Mold us shape us, melt us, and mold us into your image and into your likeness. For your wonderful potter, Lord, and we choose to remain on the potter's wheel as you continue to refine our lives and bring us forth as pure gold today. And so we commit, Lord, the work of your spirit in our lives into your hands. We commit the work of this church into your hands. And we say, Lord, let your will be done in us, with us, and through us, as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. For our visitors here this morning, I don't know what your relationship is with the Lord, but I want us all to understand today that coming to church does not make us a Christian. Coming to church doesn't make us a Christian. Coming to church, attending a church like this does not bring us into a relationship with God or make us in right standing with the Lord. There's something that we have to do. Jesus gave his life for us. We heard about it from our communion minister. He gave his life for us. He took our place on the cross so that we could be saved, saved from hell, saved from a life of destruction, saved from a life of emptiness. He gave his life. 
He is God's gift of eternal life to the entire world. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever but believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so if a gift is given, a gift must be received in order for you to have it. Jesus Christ is God's gift to us so that we will not perish. But we have to receive him as our personal Lord and Savior, inviting him, in, inviting him into our lives and making him the Lord of our lives and thereafter walking in the counsel of his word. So if you're here this morning and you want to make a commitment of your life to the Lord, I want you to raise your hand up high and I lead you in a, in a simple prayer of acceptance and commitment and your life will never be the same. Is there anyone here this morning? You want to give, who wants to give their life to the Lord? Make a commitment of your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and experience the joy of salvation. I want to lead you in a simple, simple prayer. Is there anyone here this morning? Okay. God bless you. You may be seated. Or oh, you want to sing? Okay, stand and we'll sing one song in closing. Thank you.